Well, greetings, everyone. Welcome. Today, we're going to be exploring career pathways as a resource for designing engaging learning experiences. And Lauren actually gave us a beautiful segue into this, connecting a little bit with the idea of roles and what kinds of authentic products people produce. A little bit of background about myself. I'm a former Spanish teacher, high school, turned instructional technologist and technology media quarter coordinator and eventually I went into school administration as an assistant superintendent and actually one of my favorite groups that I worked with for six years was our career in technical education when I was working as an instructional coordinator and um, I will say that today's career in tech ed is nowhere like maybe our parents career in tech ed or what we might have experienced going through school so why should we consider connecting to career in tech ed today um, I'll be referring to Career and Technical Education as CTE as we move through today. And maybe your institution is interested in connecting explicitly to CTE. Perhaps you're looking for ways to motivate students, provide a real purpose for learning a language. CTE provides a great frame to strengthen world language learning because it provides that real world context. As a language teacher, you probably fell in love with the language and the culture and you're fascinated by linguistics and literature. And the reality is some of our learners just don't share that enthusiasm. Can you imagine? But they may have other interests you can connect to. And CTE can provide a frame for you to explore and find those connections of interest that will help you design the learning opportunities that your learners will find motivating. Looking at the big picture, CTE is naturally interdisciplinary because it integrates isolated academic content areas in purposeful ways. For example, someone studying in marketing will need to understand audience, culture, text types, graphic design, research strategies, and mathematics. In marketing, there's a reason to understand how you do effective persuasive writing for a particular audience. There's a reason to understand how do you measure the impact of a marketing campaign. So CTE provides a way to connect to what interests the learners to tap their innate capacities, gifts, and talents to be problem solvers and agents of change. We've all seen those students who have unique gifts in our classroom. Well, by tapping CTE, we can start to leverage that. And CTE naturally invites interactive partnerships with companies, cultures, content, and communities. And when you engage students in those real world tasks for real world purposes, they can develop that interculturality and have an impact on the world as an agent of change. So to help you get started exploring the world of CTE, today's presentation has two parts. In the first part, we're going to have an orientation to career clusters and career pathways. And in the second part, we'll explore how the career and technology education, the CTE standards, can help us design a more meaningful inquiry. As you explore, you may be pleasantly surprised at the ideas you and your students can generate by approaching it through a CTE lens. So we need to get some terminology under our belts. First, just what are career clusters and career pathways? A career cluster is a group of jobs and industries that are related by skills or products. Within each cluster, there are cluster pathways that correspond to a collection of courses and training opportunities to prepare for a given career. So think of cluster as the general field, pathway as the particular group of careers within that field. We're going to look at a couple of examples that will help clarify that. We're going to look in the hospitality and tourism career cluster and the agriculture, food, and natural resources career cluster. So on the left, you see the career cluster, hospitality and tourism. This cluster is described as the management, marketing, and operations of restaurants and other food services lodging, attractions, recreation events, and travel-related services. So you see that's a broad group. In that career cluster, you'll find multiple pathways, which is the second column, and those are the courses and trainings. Here we see lodging, recreation, restaurants, travel, and tourism all broken out into specific pathways. If we choose one of those, travel and tourism from that second column, we follow it to the third column, we see the possible career occupations that might 
be encompassed under travel and tourism. Things with convention and visitor bureaus, tourism directors, visitor services, etc. You can imagine some of the sample occupations related to restaurant and food beverage services or occupations related to lodging. So from left to right, we have the cluster, hospitality and tourism, which contains multiple pathways, and each pathway leads to multiple occupations. Let's take a look at another one. Here we have agriculture, food, and natural resources cluster. This cluster is described as the production, processing, marketing, distribution, financing, and development of agricultural commodities and resources, including food, fiber, wood products, natural resources, horticulture, and other plant and animal product resources. So that's a pretty big grouping. When we look at then, what are various pathways that can be in that cluster? You see quite a variety. So in that second column, we see agribusiness, animal systems, food products and processing, and many more. If we can continue across to the third column, following animal systems across, we see occupations specifically related to animal systems. You can imagine we would see a totally different list if we would have followed plant systems or natural resource systems. So again, on the left, we have the cluster, which leads to pathway, which leads to the careers. So when you look at something like that, your first initial reaction is to think about some of those questions to the right. When you think of something like hospitality and tourism, I'm sure you have communicative activities you do in your classroom. Maybe you do a restaurant or hotel role play. The question is, is there a purposeful context or frame for having that conversation? Or do you do it for the sole purpose of practicing the vocabulary and grammar? Or is there a greater purpose? As we go deeper with PBLL, we hope to move from the superficial or dessert type activity to a purposeful, authentic, connected interaction. So in a few minutes, we'll look at the pathway standards that can help us do that. But let's look at just a couple of more clusters before we look at all the clusters. On the left, we see a few more clusters and pathways, architecture and construction, arts, avian technology and communications, business management administration, and underneath those clusters, you see a few of the pathways. Lauren brought up earlier that you could connect to AP and IB. And I agree. I guarantee those themes connect to career clusters and pathways. Another thing to think about is, does your institution have clubs or groups related to clusters or pathways? Are there connections to real world tasks and what you're already asking students to do? And are there any real world problems that are motivating to your school community? For example, some organizations and institutions are involved in service projects. Perhaps they help build schools, provide school supplies, work on clean water solutions. So there may be opportunities to connect or create new connections and solve real world problems. You're probably wondering how many career clusters are there? There are 16. And not only are there 16 career clusters, there are then 79 pathways, and that connects to unlimited careers, because you know there are jobs that will exist in five years that don't even exist today. This visual will be hard to see over your screen, so you'll be able to enjoy a larger picture of it in the support materials. Um, the Minnesota Department of Education visually organized the 16 career clusters and their 79 pathways, and many states have a similar organizer. If you were to look at this, this diagram as a clock, the bolded headings are the career clusters, and hospitality and tourism, which we were just looking at, is on the left side at about 9 o'clock. At about 12 o'clock, you'll find agriculture, food, and natural resources. At 1 and 2 o'clock, arts and communications, information technology. If we continue clockwise, we'll come down to 4 and 5 o'clock, transportation, STEM, manufacturing. Down at the bottom at 6 o'clock, health services, which is actually a huge field. 7 to 9 o'clock, we see various human services, so law, public safety, 
government, public administration, and education. So as you scan this visual and you start thinking about how do you connect to a particular career cluster or pathway, you may see connections to multiple clusters and that's perfectly normal and logical because even something like marketing, when we talked about that a moment ago, it does involve perhaps graphic design, which might be up in arts and AV, as well as business administration, which is in a different area. So clusters and pathways. Hopefully now we have that terminology and hierarchy between clusters and pathways clear. We have our 16 clusters, which have 79 pathways leading to those unlimited number of careers. So we wanna take a moment and let you ponder and process what it is that you just heard. So are there clusters and pathways that you know might be of interest to the learners in your school? We'll explore strategies to discover that in lesson eight, but there might be particular careers that are of interest to your student population and you know that already. Are there careers more common than others or in demand in your community? Some communities have rich histories related to tourism or manufacturing or farming. There may be influential employers in your community. There may be particular language needs in your community or maybe your community has sister schools or sister cities. Your community might also have programs in place to prepare learners for careers that you might not have thought about connecting into. Those could be service learning opportunities, work study programs, local or regional CTE partnerships, dual enrollment initiatives with two and four year colleges. Many schools now have those, but world language teachers haven't tapped into that. And quite frankly, that is an area that's just ripe for inclusion. Your institution might have community partnerships with nonprofits. Your higher ed institution language department might have partnerships with other academic departments to develop language specific courses related to particular fields of study, such as healthcare or law enforcement. Or if your career and tech center has a big emphasis in a particular area like healthcare, perhaps you partner with them around health care and languages. So just thinking about what is the situation of career and technical education in your community. So in the second part, we're actually going to look at how the CTE standards can give you some inspiration and strengthen your project ideas and student learning. In order to be able to do that, you need to understand a little bit about how the CTE standards are organized. So the CTE standard documents have basically four sections and they're labeled A, B, C, D. And in section A, they'll refer to academic standards. And when they're referring to academic standards, they always defer to the respective state academic standards. CTE teachers will often perform a crosswork of their program to state level academic standards. So when you look for academic standards in these particular documents at the national level, actually you won't find them. You won't find crosswalks there. Those crosswalks are usually done at the state level. But you will be more concerned about section B, C, and D. Section B contains the Common Career Technical Core Standards, which are known as Career Ready Practices, and in the document referred to essential knowledge and skills. So that's a mouthful and they have a little bit of terminology and labeling going on there. The third area of the standards in Section C are the Cluster Foundation Knowledge and Skill Statements, and that would apply to all the pathways in that cluster. And then finally, Section D, contain the specific pathway knowledge and skill statements. So this between B, C, and D, they start general and they become very specific. And we'll give you some examples of those. The Common Career Technical Core Ready Practices are the umbrella standards for all CTE programs. And there are 12 standard practices that every program includes. So take a moment, and look at these 12 core practices. These practices dovetail quite nicely with gold standard PBL. 
the pathway to 21st century learnings, 21st century skills, actful 21st century skills, and the world readiness standards for learning languages. Anne, did you see number 12? Yeah, we should be very excited about that. The world of work recognizes the importance of global competence and interculturality. Let's look at level C, the cluster knowledge and skills. Now remember, the cluster is the group of pathways. So this is a set of knowledge and skill standards that apply to all the pathways in that cluster. So earlier we used the example of the hospitality and tourism cluster. So here you see some sample statements of cluster level skills common to all the cluster pathways. So whether it's studying about restaurants, hotels, tour services, convention bureaus, all of these same skills apply in this particular cluster. And then we have the specific pathway knowledge and skill statements. These are going to be the most specific. So again, we are still in the hospitality and tourism career cluster, and you're seeing an excerpt of restaurants and food beverage services pathway standards. Now, you've seen a lot of standards go by. Rest assured, we are not proposing that you incorporate all the skill statements in your PBLL project. Nope, don't do it. Don't do it. Each pathway has dozens of very specific knowledge and skill statements, and these are designed to be the outcomes of a one to two year program of study. What we're proposing is that as you develop your project, peruse the knowledge and skill statements for ideas on how to strengthen and provide the authentic purpose for the tasks of your project. The knowledge and skill statements can serve as that source of inspiration and authentic task to help you design a robust project with tasks that really happen in the real world. Continuing to look at that level D, the specific pathway standards, you'll find some useful sample indicators and tasks. And by sample, they're that. They're samples, they're examples, they're not requirements. We're in the hospitality and tourism cluster, the travel and tourism pathway. And as you look at the screen, depending on the level of your language learner, you can imagine the complexity of language that the students might produce. Maybe it would be at the novice level, maybe it would be at the intermediate level. And that would be appropriate depending on the task that you design. So in the sample indicators, you're going to find your ideas and inspiration for tasks, how you design and scaffold the tasks, what level of proficiency you determine for the output is part of the PBLL process. And Sharice will be sharing effective scaffolding techniques in a later lesson. So even something as simple as a menu can connect to multiple pathways. So we could shift something even like this from a dessert activity to having some more meaningful connections in real world. And this would fall into the somewhat authentic category because it simulates the real world. But a restaurant owner might ask actually more complex questions than we think. The restaurant owner will be thinking about who are my customers? How can I design a menu that has appealing images and text for my customers? What colors, logos, and fonts? Do we produce our own photos? Do we engage photographers? And then who owns the right to the photos? What kind of descriptive text is appropriate for our menu? And what makes descriptive text effective in our target culture and audience? And how do restaurants arrive at the prices that are on their menus? How is food cost out? And then are there health notices that need to be on the menu for undercooked meats and seafoods, nutritional information, allergies, nuts, vegetarian, gluten-free? Do we need any kind of markers? And what kind of markers do we use for that? So even for a seemingly simple task, we could choose to incorporate real-life tasks and scenarios. Even with a task like creating a menu, you could differentiate in the classroom. For example, if some students were particularly interested in graphic design, others in business and entrepreneurship, others in health and nutrition, you could actually develop tasks around this menu 
that are of interest to those students. Suddenly the menu moves beyond simply categorizing food and making up prices to becoming more authentic. I'm not implying that every task you do become complex, as there are good reasons to have simple tasks, but I am suggesting that as you develop your PBLL project, seek out that which makes the task real world. What makes the task then provide some motivation and authenticity? Combine that with solving a real world problem and a real world purpose, and now you're going to be able to motivate your students. So, again, time to pause for a moment and process. Are there activities that you would like to strengthen in your PBL inquiry? What clusters and pathways might you connect to? With the idea you're developing, you might think, well, just like she described with menus, I might be able to have one group working on this aspect and another group working on that aspect. So thinking about different ways to connect to careers. So I'm just going to give you about 10 or 15 seconds. And when you think about the product square, and we're giving you a brainstorming tool in the project blueprint to help you make some of those connections, you may be surprised as you browse through the interesting authentic task connections you can make and strengthen your project. So with PBLL, we want you to be able to make that shift from casual activity to purposeful problem-based language learning. Digging into the CTE standards can provide a depth and richness to your project you might not have previously considered. At a minimum, it can help you strengthen the classroom activities. By engaging professionals in the field, we can actually ask what kinds of problems they experience and potentially assist in problem-solving process with their company. Now, some of you might be thinking this, oh no, but I don't know anything about that career cluster. I know nothing about graphic design or I know nothing about pricing food in a restaurant or manufacturing or 3D printing and that's okay. You are the designer of the learning experiences that will enable the learners to explore and solve that problem that's of interest to them while doing that in the target language. You don't need to solve the problem or have the solution to the problem, that's going to be their work to do. Your job is to design the learning experiences and provide voice and choice and an authentic audience and authentic product for your students. So what are your next steps? Ask yourself if what you're asking the students to do is something someone in the world of work would do. The product score is going to help you with that. Explore the CTE standards. Become familiar with the documents because there's hundreds of potential standards. Maybe choose one cluster to start with and browse through those skills and knowledge and see what you find. As you develop your ideas, now is the time to be brainstorming and identifying potential ideas. While you might not use all the ideas, it prepares you to help engage all of your students based on their interest. In the support materials, I'm going to put a little cheat sheet around some of the documents that are on the CTE website because there's one document that I think you will find the most useful for browsing, and that's going to be the first document listed in each cluster page. It's going to be the document called the Common Career Technical Core with Performance Elements. That document happens to have all of the standards that you need for that whole cluster with some sample indicators listed in one place. If you are looking for something very specific, you could go down to that particular pathway and look at that document, and that is fine. But the first document will actually let you peruse an entire cluster. So we'll have this information on the website, and I'll explain some of these documents in greater detail. But I like the first one, the Common Career Technical Core with Performance Elements, as you're looking at perusing the different clusters. So let's check. Thinking about the inquiry idea you have. Is it a real world 
problem or question, check it against the CTE standards and tasks. Does it really exist out there in the world of work? That's what we're going to aim for. Are you including voice and choice? Perhaps you have a project with multiple facets. Students are going to be able to work congruent with their career interests. Authentic audience, authentic product. So I think you can see there's great opportunity here as you start this journey looking at career pathways, career clusters, and leveraging those to help design really effective PBLL projects. So over this week, we invite you to explore the standards by brainstorming possible connections to clusters and pathways. And in lesson eight, we're going to dig deeper into designing some of those authentic tasks. 